Hey, Pokemon Masters, Bucky but Toby here, and today I have a quick Pokemon theory. Hey, a Pokemon theory, I feel like I haven't done one of these in forever, and this one is not one of my own. This one was actually suggested to me back when I went out to Amsterdam to meet some of you. This by the wonderful viewer Chris King, and he suggested this theory, and I thought it just made so much sense. And that is the story of how Diancie came from a carbink. See, it's already pretty widely accepted that the mythical Pokemon Diancie is a mutated carbink. In fact, it says it in the Pokedex entry. We know this already, and there's so few times when we actually get a solid, clear explanation as to where some of the mythical Pokemon have come from. Mew, Manaphy, Fiona, Darkrai, Celebi, Victini, we don't know where these Pokemon come from originally, but this one we do. It's definitely a Carbink. And that makes sense, because Carbink has crystallized uh, bits of carbon, I suppose. And Diancie is made of diamonds, and the way that a diamond becomes a diamond from carbon is just under intense heat and pressure. Except, that doesn't actually make a lot of sense for Carbink, because it doesn't live underground under intense heat and pressure in the same way that Steelix would evolve from Onyx and have a full body made of diamond. My original Pokemon theory, everyone. That's how the Crystal Onyx is made of diamond. And anyway, they don't go deep underground. They actually float above it. So if that's the case, how could a Carbink become a Diancie? And how many more are there? Well, potentially there is only one Diancie in the world of Pokemon. Maybe, maybe not. I know the movie, I believe, suggests otherwise, although I haven't watched that movie more than once because, ugh. Diancie's voice. But have you noticed how the other mythical Pokemon of Kalos are all heavily tied to the region? Volcanion is a Pokemon that destroyed mountains in southern Kalos, allowing people to live there. Hoopa is responsible for Parfum Palace. Responsible as in it stole it from another dimension, maybe even the human world. And that was also a theory that I did with MNJ TV Pokevids years ago. Wow, referencing all the old theories today. But Diancie doesn't seem to have any real ties to Kalos. However, it was suggested to me by Chris King that perhaps the way that Carbink became Diancie is it was hit when the beam that came off from the ultimate weapon, when that weapon fired and that energy beam went up into the sky and came back down, it hit a carbink on the way. And rather than killing the carbink, it mutated it into a Diancie. Intense heat and pressure. Everything you need to take carbink from a Diancie. And at first I thought, well, that's just a bit speculative, I, I guess. But not only does it tie it to the region more and the lore of the region, it also makes sense because Diancie has a mega evolution. And it's known that the infinity energy that came out from that weapon, that created many of the mega stones. If not all of them, likely as a result of all the Pokemon that died fighting. Now, it's unlikely that anyone was sending a carbink into battle. Steelix, Rhyperia, Carbink. I mean, maybe they were, but then again, wouldn't that just mean that Carbink has a Mega Evolution? No, it's Diancie that gets the Mega Evolution. And we know that there are some Pokemon that can have Mega Evolutions, even though they definitely weren't involved in the battle from 3,000 years ago where the infinite weapon was fired. Like, for example, Mewtwo, another legendary Pokemon that has Mega Stones. Those were created artificially, most likely by Team Rocket, as seen in Pokemon Origins. So the fact that Diancie has a Mega Evolution and not Carbink, Carbink suggests that it was somehow related to the Infinity Weapon, to the, the Ultimate Weapon, but in a slightly different way. And given that it is a beam of, like, super energy, intense heat and pressure is kind of applied if that beam goes up into the sky and comes back and lands on Carbink's head, mutating it into an all-new Pokemon, Diancie. Also, and this is kind of a side note to the theory, the one place that you can find Carbink in the Kalos region is Reflection Cave, an area that in the anime it houses a whole other dimension. The Mirror Dimension it seems to be some kind of portal in Reflection Cave that leads to that world. Potentially this rift in time and space in the universe was caused as a result of the energy from the ultimate weapon landing here. Maybe, maybe not. It's kind of speculative, but one thing is for sure. Reflection Cave, where you find Carbink, is right next to Geosense Town, where the ultimate weapon resides. Greetings, Poker fans! Michael here. I'm Morgan Freeman. The secrets of the cosmos lie through the wormhole. Welcome to the fifth installment of Strange Pokemon Physics. The 18th Pokemon movie is coming out this weekend, so I thought it'd be fun to talk about the main star of the movie. However, the physics for this episode are going to be of more of a quantum nature, and therefore a bit heftier and theoretical than most other SPPs. So, I wanted to get some help. Pokemon Masters! Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> Bucky Batobi here. Hey, hey. Poke fans. Right, right, of course. Poke fans. I am pleased today to be joined by Bird Keeper Toby, Pokemon theorist and. Bird Keeper. Toby, tell us what you know about Hoopa. 
Well now, Michael Hooper is a mystery. Even to me, it's only been recently discovered and it's incredibly rare. Luckily, I don't go anywhere without the encyclopedia of all Pokemon knowledge, my Pokedex. And today, our Pokedex has been upgraded by the Exelion AI. What's going on guys, Pokedex Analyst Excelion here, and I'm going to be filling you in on all the Hoopa information you could possibly need. Now before we continue, I just want to let you guys know that this SPP will be a lot more theoretical and even a bit conspiracy theory-ish compared to most other SPPs, so there won't really be any calculations in it. But, you still get to learn about some cool quantum physics stuff. So without further ado, I present to you the Pokemon that whether it likes it or it doesn't like it, it definitely puts a ring on it. Hoopa. Hoopa, the mischief Pokemon. Hoopa is a legendary psychic and ghost type. This troublemaker sends anything and everything to faraway places using its loop, which can warp space. Warping space? Anything and everything? If it's able to do that, just how powerful is Hoopa? In order to do this, Hoopa is creating portals, gateways in the universe, joining two instances of space and time together. In the real world, these portals are known as wormholes, and they are only theoretical. However, that doesn't seem to be the case in the Pokemon world. So like Toby said, Hoopa is connecting two points in space or time. However, in terms of energy requirement, it gets a bit tricky. You see, for a wormhole to exist, it requires something called negative energy. Negative energy occurs when an area of space has less than nothing in it. Which sounds crazy, I know. But according to recent quantum physics discussions, warping space and time appears to be possible. A study called Natural Wormholes as Gravitational Lenses suggested that these portals fueled by negative energy were actually pretty common in the early universe. However, sustaining them would still require immense amounts of energy, especially if they had to stay open long enough to fit some of the bigger Pokemon through them. Rayquaza, the Sky High Pokemon. In Rayquaza's mega form, his length reaches a total of 35 feet and 5 inches. It has been documented that Hoopa is able to sustain a single portal long enough to send not only Mega Rayquaza, but also several other Pokemon through it. So, for a Pokemon that size to be allowed through one of Hoopa's portals, Hoopa must have the ability to generate negative energy. This is demonstrated in the movie and in the games by Hoopa's portals remaining open long enough for you to at least battle legendary Pokemon through them. However, physicist Michio Kaku talks on an episode of Through the Wormhole about something that alludes to Hoopa's power being even greater. This is that wormholes don't only connect two points of space and time, but could connect different universes altogether. I discussed the alternate timelines and universes of the Pokemon world in an earlier video, but in a nutshell, the idea is that there are parallel universes of the Pokemon world, with slight differences in events and other things, such as the existence of Mega Evolution. So it's possible that Hoopa can not only connect space and time within one universe, but connect different Pokemon universes. Let's look into this more by checking out its Omega Ruby Dex entry. In its true form, it possesses a huge power. Legends of its avarice tell of how it once carried off an entire castle to gain the treasure hidden within. There are lots of castle-like structures in the Pokemon universe, including Shabnu Castle, the Battle Castle, even many of the Pokemon Leagues. But one of the more intriguing castles is Parfum Palace in Kalos. If you obtain a Hoopa in Pokemon X and Y versions, there is an NPC in Parfum Palace who triggers a conversation mentioning that he's been studying Hoopa across the world. So, of all of the places in the world, why is he here in Parfum Palace, studying Hoopa? Our theory is that Parfum Palace is one of the castles that Hoopa moved with this ability. And not only do we think that it didn't originate at that point in Kalos, but we also believe that it didn't originate in that universe at all. Parfum Palace is actually based on the Palace of Versailles. Versailles is known for having an extravagant garden, a hall of mirrors, and large regal statues. It was also built by King Louis XIV in the second half of the 17th century. If all of that sounds familiar, it should. Parfum Palace has a massive garden, its own hall of mirrors, and some big Pokemon statues. And like Versailles, it was constructed by a king. A king that bears quite a bit of resemblance to Louis XIV. Well, and AZ apparently, but whatever. Lots of places in the Pokemon world, including the regions themselves, are based on real-life places, but very few of them bear as close a resemblance as Parfum does to Versailles. The Palace of Versailles is massive, but given Hoopa's ability to create negative energy, it would be safe to assume that he could manage this, even bring it from a different universe. It's still worth noting that Versailles is still in our universe, but wormholes go through space and time, so maybe Hoopa will come for it in the future? Who knows? So let's review the facts. 
Hooper can create wormholes, which means he can generate negative energy, at least enough to maintain these portals to allow large Pokemon and heavy buildings through. We also know that wormholes are gateways not just between different points in space and time, but also alternate universes. Wait, but if he can do that, that means he could be in this universe. He could even be in this very video. Ah! Oh shoot. Well, it looks like Excellion and Toby have been sucked into one of Hoopa's wormholes. That's okay though, because you can easily go after them by following them through the rings to their channels. I'm gonna do the same thing, so until next time, Poke fans. Gotta catch them all! Okay, so Ilmio, one of my new favorite trial captains, the normal type trial captain who is there at the beginning of the game to teach you the basics of Pokemon battling. But my curiosity about Ilmio first peaked when I found his house in the town that he's from. In his house there are trophies and awards of adventures he's been on, there's the Lumios Gazette, which is a delicacy from the Kalos region, and speaking of Kalos, just upstairs outside his room is a painting of a scenic view from Kalos. And that's interesting, because it tells me that this guy almost definitely completed the Kalos League at some time or another. And if you speak to his mum, it turns out that he did in fact study away in Kalos before coming back to the Alola region and becoming trial captain. There is another character who pops up a lot later on, one of my favorite characters in these games in fact. Her name is Mina and I love her design, I love the paintbrush hair thing, that's amazing. She is an artist who seems to know about Ilma and what he's all about, his trial, and they seem to have some kind of connection. And you can tell that because as I said, she's an artist and the key Pokemon on Ilma's team is a Smurgle. And if you look at the artist class from generation 6, all they use is Smurgles. Makes sense, they're the painter Pokemon. And a painting, that's something that we've already talked about, a painting from Kalos. So using these little dots, joining them up and reading between the lines, there's actually a story to be painted here. Ilmia studied abroad in Kalos, possibly also taking on the Kalos League. There he met a potential artist, Mina. And for whatever reason, he acquired a painting of hers and her Smeargle. I decided I'd look more into it, and so I wanted to look at where you can find artists the training class, generally in Generation 6. And it turns out all the ones from X and Y are on Revere Walk. It's a route which has four artists. All of them have Smeargles, and the reason that the artist trained class are all on that route is because it's described as being a scenic route in Kalos, popular among artists. So it seems to me that that picture on Ilmia's wall, that's probably of Revere Walk. And it gets even better because then I was like, well, what if one of these artists could have been Mina? And I found one NPC and she was called Mona? Mona! Damn it, so close! But I wasn't going to give up there, so I went to Lumio City. We know he's been there because of the Lumios Gazette. And there I went to the Lumios Museum, the home of art in Kalos, and had a look at some of the paintings myself. And there I saw one of Levere City. I'm definitely butchering these French pronunciations. And that's when I remembered, Mina is also a trial captain, and she is the captain of the fairy-type Pokemon. And if there's a home of fairy-type Pokemon in Kalos, it's Levira City. And so I thought maybe that's where she's from. I mean, especially when you look at the skin tone difference between Mina and Ilmia, clearly Mina is not from Alola. And if she was an artist in Kalos, then there's a good chance that she had a Smurgle. And sure enough, in Levira City, there is an artist. This character doesn't say a lot other than they're making crafty wallets out of Arbok's shedded skin. So that's the thing, and that's sort of where my investigation came to an end. Maybe this NPC is Mina. What seems certain to me is that Ilmia traveled to Kalos to study and take on the Kalos League. Whilst there got interested in art and artists and met Mina, and for whatever reason, Mina gifted Ilmia with her Smeargle and a nice painting of Kalos. But you're gonna have to let me know, what have I missed? Is Hey, Pokemon Masters, Berkey Batobi here. And today's Pokemon theory is not a massive one in the grand scheme of things. It's not about the vast expanse of the Pokemon universe or the origins of some legendary or character. I have done plenty of those kind of videos. No, today is just about one single Pokemon, Pangoro. Pangoro is the daunting Pokemon, and it's the evolved form of the very beloved Pancham, and its Pokemon son Pokedex entry claims that this Pokemon boasts incredible physical strength, and those that wish to become its trainer have to converse with their fists. That sounds terrifying. So the question of today is, why have I taken an interest in this Pokemon? It's because of the way it evolves. Pangoro can only evolve from a Pancham if you level it up past level 32 with a dark type Pokemon in your party. 
And there are lots of wacky evolution methods out there. There's trading, there's evolving holding an item or leveling up with high friendship. And with those Pokemon, there tends to be a common theme, which is that you can't find them in the wild. Apart from in Black and White 2, you can find Crobat and Gliscor. It's, it's a whole weird thing. But it makes sense. After all, you need to have a dark type Pokemon on your team to evolve Pancham. Why would you be able to find a Pangoro in the wild? Except in Sun and Moon, you can. This is as a result of SOS chaining, the point in a battle where Pancham gets so scared that you're gonna defeat it that it calls for help. Normally it will only call for other Pancham, but in rare conditions, it will call for Pangoro. That means there's a population of wild Pangoro on routes 10, 11, and 17 of the Alola region. So how did they, this Pokemon that only can possibly exist in a trainer's party, appear in the wild? Well, the key to working this out might be SOS chaining itself. See, it doesn't say it has to be in a trainer's party, it says that the dark type Pokemon has to be in Pancham's team, and SOS chaining is kind of like the Pokemon are teaming up. Let's say you're battling a Pancham and it calls for help and it calls a wild Pangoro. Pangoro is fighting in dark type. And then as a result of calling for Pangoro, it manages to beat you, the trainer. You scurry off to the Pokemon Center, but what you don't see is that the Pancham, which on Route 17 are around their level of evolution, they gain experience, much as you would if you had beaten the Pancham and Pangoro. And because there's a Pangoro on the team with Pancham, a dark type Pokemon, that Pancham then evolves and then continues the cycle for other wild Pancham. Pancham. It's not even sounding like a word at this point. But there is a problem with that theory, which is, where did the initial Pangoro come from? It's possible that a trainer released their Pangoro back into the wild to look out for Pancham, which is kind of like how Ash did with his Pidgeot releasing it to a flock of Pidgey to look after them in Pallet Town. I imagine if you could SOS chain in Viridian Forest with Pidgeys and stuff, maybe there would be like a one in a million chance that you would encounter Ash's Pidgeot. Man, I'm sure Ash promised to go back for that Pidgeot at some point. But there's actually a different theory here that works so much better with, with the nature of the Alola region, the Pokemon you find there. See, on routes 10, 11, and 17, the routes where you can find Pancham and Pangoro, you can also find another dark type Pokemon, Raticate. The Alolan Raticate, of course, and Raticate has undergone its own very interesting kind of evolution in Alola. Because originally it just looked like your normal top percentage Rattata and Raticate, but then they introduced Young Goose to deal with the Rattata and Raticate population. Rattata and Raticate had to adapt to survive becoming dark types and only appearing at night. This is how we have Alolan Raticate today. However, that process will have taken many, many years. How would Rattata or Raticate have survived at all if the Alolan people were bringing in a Pokemon specifically designed to deal with it? Well, perhaps they had another sort of coping mechanism, which was SOS chaining. The local Rattata and Raticate calling for help, and on those routes, it could call for Pancham, the fighting type that would help it deal with Young Goose or Gumshoes. And this isn't unusual. Some Pokemon can call for help Pokemon of different species. Normally, it's Pokemon that are like tied into its evolution. So you look at like Marini, for example. Marini can call upon Corsola. If you read the Pokedex entries for Marini, you realize that it actually eats Corsola, and this is an evolutionary trick. It's tricking its food into coming and helping it. This so at the end of the battle, it can get a nice little snack out of it. Well, perhaps Alolan Raticates had this exact same evolutionary trick, where they were calling upon Pancham, a totally different species of Pokemon, to help it. Pancham, being fighting type, would be able to deal with Young Goose, but not only that, as the Rattata and Raticate changed over time and turned into the Alolan variants, they gained the dark typing. And this meant that every time a Raticate and a Pancham were able to deal with a Young Goose or Gumshoes, the Pancham would gain experience level up and evolve into Pangoro. So this is a sort of symbiotic evolution where you have Raticate benefiting because it gets to survive and eventually transition into being a dark type of night dweller to avoid the young goose. But also you have wild Pancham benefiting from that battle, being able to evolve in the wild into Pangoro, something that cannot be done anywhere else in the Pokemon world. But that, of course, is just my little Pokemon theory on this topic. I'd love to know what you think about it in the comments below. Well, hello there, Pokemon Masters, Berkey Potobi here. I love Mew. It's the Pokemon that almost single-handedly propelled the Pokemon franchise to the level of popularity that it did back in the 90s. Everyone was talking about using strength on moving trucks and everyone had the ancient Mew card in their pocket. More recently, I was lucky enough to attend the only event outside of Japan where they were giving away virtual console versions of Mew. And mine got timid nature and almost perfect IVs. I I'm not a competitive battler, but I got an almost perfect Mew. Mew is a Mirage Pokemon, that much is sure, and it says so in the Pokedex. It also says some other things, like it's the ancestor of all Pokemon. But if that's the case, out of the over 800 creatures in the Pokemon world, if it shares DNA with most of them, then surely some of them must be closer related to it than others. And that's where I'll be joining you. Well, hello there, Alchemist, fellow Pokemon theorist and Pokemon researcher. 
You here for another collab video? I certainly am. So what do we know about Mew, the new species Pokemon? With incredible psychic powers, Mew is able to learn all the TMs and HMs, and it's known as the ancestor to all Pokemon. The ancestor to all Pokemon, eh? We all share a common ancestor here in the real world. You, me, monkeys, fish, the variety of different life on the planet, all the different ways that it looks and interacts with the world, all of that traces back over millions of years to common ancestors. And of course, some species still alive today, like comb jellies and simple sponges, very closely resemble what those common ancestors were for all of us. Because of course, sometimes the best way to evolve is to not fix what isn't broken. So how does that apply to the Pokemon world, where we know Mew is the common ancestor? Which ones of the over 800 species of Pokemon available are the closest related to it, genetically speaking? There are two Pokemon that we're looking at today, four if you include evolutions. The first is Eevee. Eevee is the evolution Pokemon, and similar to Mew, it has the ability to evolve into a number of different creatures, with a whole variety of different types. According to the Pokedex, it has an unstable DNA. DNA and genes aren't things often mentioned in the decks, but they also appear in entries about Mew and Mewtwo. I suppose technically Mewtwo is Mew's closest living relative, but since it was created through human intervention, let's put it on the sidelines for this video. If it is related to Mew, then that explains how Mew is responsible for such a vast variety of life, with extremely different features. One evolution in particular shares more similarities to Mew, Espeon. Espeon is also one of my favorite Pokemon. It's more feline like Mew, it's closer to the color scheme of Mew, it's psychic like Mew, and it has Synchronize like Mew. And some of its Pokedex entries talk about how the fine hair on its skin detects airwaves, allowing it to react to things before they happen. And fine hair is a big part of the focus of Mew's Pokedex entries. That's just another similarity you have, but maybe you're not feeling it. Okay, well there's another psychic cat. Another Pokemon that could be Mew's closest living relative, Esper. Also based on a cat, and with a cat sounding name, Esper is a great candidate. It's the restraint Pokemon, and has to keep its ears closed at all times, otherwise it would let out a destructive force so powerful it can blast everything at a 300 foot radius. Like Eevee, when it evolves, it diversifies quite heavily. It has a varying form depending on the gender, and while most gendered different Pokemon have subtle divergences, bigger horns, altered shapes, or lipstick, I'm looking at you, Wapafet. Meowstic is possibly the most drastic form change, except for maybe Frillish, although we'd say Meowstic more so. And there is another nod in the game that suggests Meowstic's relationship to Mew, and this is the Pokedex entry that talks about how its powers are, are so destructive they could destroy a 10-ton truck. Now, first off, the whole reason that Team Rocket wanted to use Mew to create Mewtwo is because they believed Mew to be the most powerful Pokemon on the planet, with incredible destructive capabilities. And here we go again, between both Esper and Meowstic, just Pokedex entries talking about its destructive powers. But in particular, it decides to mention a 10-ton truck, and while okay, this is a, a bit of a gimmick and maybe a bit out there, trucks are something highly associated with Mew due to a rumor back in the day. A rumor when Red and Blue were out that if you used strength on a truck that was just outside the SSN, you could capture Mew. A rumor that got very widespread popularity and that Pokemon were very aware of. So potentially this is a nod to that, but if not regardless, you can't deny that between Esper, and Meowstic, Eevee and Espeon, there are a lot of connections to Mew. And certainly if Mew is the ancestor to them all out of over 800 Pokemon, these guys are pretty good candidates to be the closest related to it, genetically speaking. Unless we miss another Pokemon, in which case you should probably let us know in the comments. Hey Pokemon Masters! My name is Berkey Potobi and thank you for clicking on this video for clicking onto this Pokemon theory. For as long as I've been a Poketuber, 3000 years has been an important date within the lore and the world of Pokemon. This date has been appearing in the Pokemon world since Generation 5, since Black and White 2's Relic Crown, which said, it said that the Relic items were made 3000 years ago. And since then, the date 3000 years ago has popped up in every single generation of Pokemon. Pokemon is clearly building towards something with this. And one of the references to 3,000 years ago is maybe a little bit under the radar, and that's what this video is all about. And I'm not going it alone. I'm going it with one of the best Pokemon theorists on YouTube, my good friend, Almighty Arceus. Hey Pokemon fans, Almighty Arceus here. 3,000 years ago was the date for four key events in Pokemon history. The first being the Relic Crown of Unova, the second being AZ's War in Kalos, the third being the Darkest Day in Galar, and the fourth is... wait, what happened? I don't know the fourth. Four things have to... I had to actually count my own fingers then. Did you notice that? There are four things that reference 3,000 years ago, and at the very beginning of the video I said every single generation, which is kind of a half-truth. 
Because there is a Pokemon, not quite in Alola and not quite in Gala. A Pokemon that doesn't quite fit in that is also relevant to this discussion. I'm talking, of course, about Meltan and Melmetal. Melmetal is the Hex Nut Pokemon. It is the evolution of the mythical Pokemon Meltan. And the way that it evolves from Meltan is pretty unique. Lots of Meltan come together, and the biggest member of the Meltan community consumes the other. This is when they evolve. At the end of their life cycle, they rust and shatter into little metallic pieces that will one day become Meltan yet again, repeating the life cycle. So we have four key events, the Relic Crown, AZ's War, the Darkest Day, and now Meltan. Surely all of those can't just be a coincidence altogether being 3000 years ago. We actually have a theory on my channel that connects both the Darkest Day and AZ's firing of the ultimate weapon. If you haven't noticed, the darkest day happened because of a flood of Gigantamax energy spreading across the wild area, emanating from Eternatus, while the ultimate weapon caused infinity energy to bolt up into the sky and land somewhere, causing the end of the war in Kalos. As I said before, we discussed this more on my channel, but it seems more than likely that these two energies, Dynamax energy and infinity energy, are in fact one and the same. For now though, let's just say it makes sense because of how close these regions actually are, Galar and Kalos, but we need to investigate a little bit more about the Relic Crown and Melmetal and his origins 3,000 years ago. What's his story? We start to learn a little bit more about Meltan and Melmetal when we start looking at their Pokedex entries, particularly Melmetal's Pokedex entry. Revered long ago for its capacity to create iron from nothing, for some reason it has come back to life after 3,000 years. Yes, that's right, that's the fourth occurrence 3,000 years ago. So the next thing to talk about here is the relic items and specifically the relic crown. How does this fit into this 3,000 year old picture? And the answer is simple. Look at this crown. It's Zashian's head. It's clearly designed of the same thing. And I've actually not too long ago done a Pokemon theory talking about how the, the ancient kings of Yanova were probably descendants of the kings of Gala. And look, if these items, including this crown, were created 3,000 years ago and it looks like Zashian's head, then that makes sense because 3,000 years ago, the heroes of Gala became the kings of Gala, so they would need, need some new headwear. Hence, when the Relic Crown was made. And now we can paint this big picture with these three events. A Pokemon world at war, the Colossian troops and the Galarian troops battling across both regions. Fighting with swords and fighting with Pokemon, the fallen heroes becoming the spirits that would later become Honedge, seen outside Parfum Palace. There's plenty of theories about that as well. And in fact, those theories very heavily tie into the character of Wickstrom, a Kalos member of the Elite Four, who interestingly has an armor color that looks like a certain Pokemon we're talking about today. He is said to be descended from these warriors and he speaks in Old English Shakespearean tongue. Old English, Galarian, Old Galarian. On top of all of that, Wickstrom is carrying the GS ball. I mean, it's right there. Now, the GS ball, in case you didn't know, was a mystery that was abandoned long ago in the Pokemon anime, and also in the second generation of Pokemon, in which you could bring the GS ball as an event item, and then Celebi would pop out of the forest near Ilex Forest. However, what you might not know is what the GS stands for. For the longest time, we believed the GS to mean simply gold and silver, but in Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, we learn from an NPC that it means greatest smith's ball, as in people who forge metal. The great smiths were clearly some kind of special organization that perhaps Wickstrom descends from. Hmm, an old Galarian organization that has its ties with metal, and their armor is the same color as Meltan? That's not a coincidence. Now, Melmetal has one other Pokedex entry you might not have seen yet, and it's a Pokedex entry to do with its Gigantamax form, where it's wearing what looks to be like a soldier's helmet. In this form, it resembles a giant Cyclops, and in fact, its Pokedex entry states that in a distant land, there's legends of a Cyclopean giant, but it turned out just to be a Melmetal that has been exposed to a ridiculous amount of Gigantamax energy. Note the wording here, in a distant land. This is written from the perspective of a Pokedex entry in Sword and Shield. So in a region that is not Gala, in Kalos, there is a legend of an ancient Cyclopean giant. 
that turned out to be one of these Mel Metal exposed to lots of Gigantamax energy. We know Gigantamax energy and Infinity energy is the same. And on what day 3,000 years ago, a date referenced in one of Mel Metal's other Pokedex entries when it was last seen, on what day was there lots of Gigantamax energy, Infinity energy, all in the same place? In Kalos. On the day the war ended when AZ let off the ultimate weapon. This is when Melmetal was exposed to a lot of Gigantamax energy and it became its Gigantamax form. It turned into this giant Cyclopean giant and then after the three turns in this form, as that's how long Gigantamaxing lasts, it, it lasted, it then rusted and fell apart into the various shards of Meltan. Its rusted metal shard remains put away inside the mystery box, the very box protected by the great smiths who were on its side in the battle. And it hasn't been seen for 3000 years. Of course, until now. While we were desperately looking for more evidence, we actually stumbled upon two particular pieces that might link this even further to being utilized in Kalos. One of them was remembering the story of the Faceless Men. Now, this is a story told to you in Kalos at the Scary House. There's this old man standing there, and he tells you how he was followed by a horde of faceless men. Now, Mel Metal is pretty renowned for its big, robust shape. It really does kind of look like a fusion between like a man and liquid metal and nuts. Oof. But it does kind of look like a faceless man if you break it down. I know that's a little bit on the sus side, but hey, roll with it here. We're working with what we got. Pokemon's feet in the scraps, and we gotta start somewhere, right? But here's something you might actually find a little bit more interesting. In France, actually really close to Paris, or in the Pokemon universe, I guess it would be Lumio City, there is a sculpture art project made by an art collective called Les Cyclops. I hope I said that right. <laughs> it's basically Cyclops in French. And take a look at what it looks like. That looks pretty similar to Meltan and Melmetal. It's got that flowing metal there. It's got that singular eye up above, and it's got the color schemes of silver and gold, very similar to Meltan and Melmetal. So it's very likely that this could be a piece of inspiration that the Pokemon team found while they were journeying through Kalos. It's quite possible that Meltan and Melmetal were planned for Generation 6 as Pokemon to be released, but they couldn't get the design perfected in time or they decided to link that up with a later project like Pokemon Go as it was released before. It is still sitting in that ambiguous etc. category, so until we get a definitive answer, we've just got to look for the evidence that we can find, and the fact that this art piece looks so similar to Meltan and Melmetal's designs really leads me to believe that this is what inspired it, and because it's in France, we're connecting it more directly to the Kalos region and having some sort of Kalos origins. This. Hey Pokemon Masters, Perky Batobi here, and today I have for you a Pokemon theory about the OG rival, Professor Oak's grandson, Blue. Blue has had many fan theories about him in the past, one we're going to be talking about today is the one about his Raticate dying. We'll get to that soon enough, but for now I'm joined by the creator of this theory, Exelion, who is here to explain to you why Pokemon X and Y versions might confirm such a theory. In these Generation 6 games, a girl in Kalos mentions that Professor Oak's grandson is in Kalos to study. A seemingly meaningless piece of exposition, however we can take a good guess as to what it means. Realistically, there's only a few good things in Kalos to study, being fashion, mega evolution, and AZ's war. I doubt Blue would travel all the way to Kalos to learn about fashion, despite how he always kept to the forefront of 90s apparel. And as for mega evolution, well there's no real point for that trip either. In Auras, we saw that Mega Evolution was not isolated to just Kalos, and in Pokemon Origins, we also saw that Mega Evolution was in Kanto. So the only possible topic left for Blue to study in Kalos is AZ's War. So here's something interesting about this NPC. She's available to speak to at the beginning of the game. This means that Blue was in Kalos before the Great Weapon was revealed, meaning he would have to study the war from other locations. And there is one location in all of Kalos that has great relevance to the war, this being a location that me and Exelion have talked about before in the past, that being Parfum Palace. The reason this place is where any research should begin is that AZ, the king of Kalos at the time of the war, built the palace. Any information on the war that you could possibly need should be able to be found here, and as with any research, the library is most likely the best place to begin. The library, in this case, doesn't really have a great selection of books on the subject. But the butler in the room does have something interesting to offer. He says, I heard that a forbidden tome once existed, that contained the secret to bring Pokemon back to life. 
It's probably just a rumor, though. We've got nothing of the sort in our library. This book, in my opinion, was clearly the outline or guide for the development of the ultimate weapon, a weapon which famously brought AZ's Floette back to life. At this point you may have already caught on, but let's go back to that original theory about Blue's Raticate dying. In Red and Blue versions, when you meet your rival in Cerulean City, he has an Abra, Pidgeotto, his starter, and a Rattata, which by the SSN has evolved into a Raticate. By the time you encounter him in Lavender Town, however, he doesn't have that Raticate anymore. Well, of course, most people speculate that his Raticate died on the SSN when you battled him. Jeez, that's harsh. This is heavily implied by the fact when he meets you in Lavender Town, he says, what are you doing here? Your Pokemon don't look dead. So my theory is that, based on the timeline of the games and how popular the fan theory is, Game Freak threw in this little comment as a nod towards the idea that Blue visited this palace and checked that book out. He would have did this in hopes of reviving his long lost friend, but of course, those are just my thoughts. Let us know what you think about this theory in the comments. Pokemon Masters, Birdkeeper Toby here. Recently, I've been playing Pokemon Sun and Moon and traversing the world of Alola, and there are loads of interesting areas. One I find of particular interest for this video is the Lake of the Sun, or Moon, depending on which version you're playing, or which parallel universe you're living in. The Lake of the Sun and Moon appears to be a ritual site that goes largely unexplained in the game. NPCs talk about they wonder what it was used for, but we never actually get a clear-cut answer. Or so you think. But in this video, I want to fully explore exactly what happened there. But in order to understand what happened there a long time ago, we need to go way back to the beginning of Alola. Alola was established and founded by people who rode across the waves on Pokemon's back to find it. These trainers likely came from Kanto and Johto, as indicated by trainers in Mali City and the Mali City architecture, as well as dialogue from NPCs on the docks of Akala Island. And we know that these islands were already inhabited by the local Pokemon and, of course, the Tapus, the Guardian Pokemon. The humans of the Pokemon world set up their colonies and their kingdoms, and in fact a kingdom would have been established with a clear leader, the King of Alola at the time, as referenced in the Mali City Library. We'll get onto that. But according to those books found in the library, the sky opened up and the Pokemon of the sun or moon, depending on the version you're playing, came down. And that is when the Tapus of each island appeared and fought with that Pokemon. The Tapus lost, but the Pokemon of the sun or moon granted the Tapus the power of nature, which would probably be their Z-moves. And then there's a very interesting line of text within these books. It says that there was born a fragile heir, and it's the Tapu's job to guide them. Now, we know that there isn't royalty in Alola anymore, not really. The current leaders of Alola really are the Kahunas, and the Kahunas are selected and guided by the Tapu, so I think this is what it means by a fragile heir. It changed from being a kingdom revolving around royalty to, to this newer version of royalty where the Kahunas led each island. And this could be reflected in what Ace Roller or Acarola, I don't know how to pronounce her name yet, I'm gonna go with Ace Roller. This is reflected in what the, the Ghost Trial Captain, who said that her father was basically royalty. So we know that there isn't royalty, but there is basically royalty, and I think that means the Kahuna. And yes, I think her dad was the Kahuna of the island that you find her on, Ula Ula Island. And in fact, for that matter, she calls Nanu, who is the current Kahuna, her uncle. This is a disputed point. Because in the Pokemon Sun and Moon official guide, it says that Nanu is referred to as uncle, but in the same way that people refer to people in Alola as cousin. It's kind of more of a term of endearment, a term of knowing each other. But then again, the Pokemon official guides have been wrong about a few things before. So I'm not sure whether to count it or not within the canon of the game. It doesn't really change this theory though. Because the Ghost Child Captain says that she has to move the books to stop them from being ruined. Being ruined from where? Well, my guess is the Old Kingdom where her basically royal father used to live, in Po Town. Po Town, with its giant fortress-like walls, are designed very much like a kingdom, like the kind of place where a kingdom would be, kind of like the Azoth Kingdom, actually. And maybe part of Team Skull and Guzma overthrowing Po Town was eliminating the Kahuna at the time. Maybe they're a little bit darker than we think. I mean, there is actually a throne room in that mansion. So why is this important? What's it actually got to do with the Lake of the Sun or the Moon? Well, all of these things, the Ghost Trial Captain and Poe Town and the Mali City Library and the texts that talk about the ancient history of Alola, which why would the Ghost Trial Captain even have unless it was relevant to like her family? 
All of these things are on the same island, Ula Ula Island. And that island is the island where you find the Lake of the Sun or the Moon. And there is one other connection people have made, and that is the connection between the Ghost Trial Captain and the Psychic Gym Leader from Kalos, Olympia. For the most part, it's purely aesthetic, but I did mention in a previous video about Olympia having a relation to Lunala, and it's possible if she's part of this family of Alolan near royalty royals, a family who respects the history of Alolan culture, hence why they're keeping hold of these books and trying to make them, you know, keep them safe, that she's part of a tribe that worships Lunala, which is exactly what I speculated about in that video. And the city where Olympia lives is Anastar City that has the sundial, which I speculated there might be like a second one, like a parallel one in Alola. And sure enough, the structure on top of Mount Lanakilla, it's very clearly not made of ice and may well be that moon dial or alternative sundial that I speculated about in my Anastar City sundial video. But that is just speculative. Anyway, the point is that everything seems to be happening on this island. Why? Well, quite simply, if the Ghost Trial Captain is a descendant of those original royals of Alola, and is part of this kingdom that is was once Potown that's now been taken over by Team Skull, then it's possible that that original battle between the Tapus and the Pokemon of the Sun and Moon happened on that island, and where better for it to have happened than at the Lake of the Sun or the Moon? And hence, why that lake is so destroyed and now abandoned. And so it seems that the story is that after this big battle between the Tapus and the Beast of the Sun or the Moon, the loss of the Tapus and the establishment of the Kahuna's beginning, they built a new altar, the Altar of the Sun or the Moon, away from civilization on the other side of the vast Pony Canyon. And that is where the great trainers of Alola and the Kahunas go to worship Solgaleo and Lunala. Away from the original site where the sky first opened up and Solgaleo or Lunala appeared. And one final bit of evidence for that is that in the post game, if you want to get yourself a second Cosmog, you have to go to a parallel dimension to get one from the Lake of the Sun or Moon. You probably can't get it from your own because it's the one that's already appeared, it's the one that's with you. The one from the history books in the Mali City Library. Well, what do you think? So, the Roton Dex. Who created it? In my previous video, I speculated about Professor Oak. Professor Oak has a weird obsession with both Rotom and the Pokedex, being the creator of the Pokedex and also having caught a Rotom in the anime. As well as that, he has a home in Eterna City, right next to Eterna Forest, where you first encounter Rotom. And generally speaking, he is one of the best innovators of the Pokemon world. As well as that, he's aware and has communications with all of the other Pokemon professors in the Pokemon world and some of the applications for Rotom you can find them inside Professor Sycamore's lab. So there was a lot to work with there. Potentially, Professor Oak was the one who created the Rotom decks. And it turns out I was right. Thanks to a line of dialogue in Pokemon Sun and Moon, I was right, Oak did create the Pokedex. Just not this Oak, this one. It's not even really a theory. Samson Oak just comes out and says it. I made the Rotom Dex. But what I want to explore is the follow up to that, where he says he made the Rotom Dex with another young researcher a young friend of his in Kalos. So he didn't make it with the original Professor Oak, he made it with a Pokemon scientist from Kalos. So that's really what I wanted to investigate. Who could it be? Who are the potential people? And immediately Professor Sycamore jumps to mind. I mean, after all, he's young, dreamy, he has good knowledge of Pokemon, and as I said earlier, you find the appliances to change Rotom's form in his lab. He does make for a good candidate, but I think there's one that's better. And that is this random NPC scientist. Yeah, he's a way better candidate. Why? Because he is on the same floor as the appliances that Rotom changes into. Yeah, yeah, okay, but hang on a second. There are loads of scientists on the same floor. Why this one in particular? Well, just below him, there is a child who talks about how a washing machine and a television are necessary research on a certain Pokemon. Of course, he's referring to Rotom, which is weird because apart from when you encounter Rotom in Platinum, you never actually get a TV form of Rotom. So it seems that experiments on Rotom were going on on that floor. We should have known they were going to do something different with it, maybe give it a new form. And you know, part of me likes to imagine that that little kid, he's the scientist who helped create it. But no, 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 it has to be that NPC from before. And why? Because he's the professor who gives you the Pokemon radar, a device that scans the surrounding area for Pokemon. And one of the key features for the Rotom Dex is that it has a map on it a scan of the surrounding area. You're able to see the whole area around you. It's fantastic. And so while yes, I know this is only a mini bit of speculation and a mini theory, I don't think it was Sycamore. I, I don't think it was the kid. I think Samson Oak developed the Rotom decks with a guy who gives you the poker radar from Pokemon X and Y. Like
Hello, Pokemon Masters. Berkey Patobi here. And over the years, I have done so many different Pokemon theories. This video started as two completely separate theories that... It's cat hair. That's cat hair. This video started as two completely separate theories, but I realized they are one and the same. They are two to three parts of a bigger whole. So this video might feel a little discombobulated between the three sections, but I'll draw it all together with a conclusion at the end. Also, I didn't want to lose out on the cool live action intros that I did in some very cool places, but this is my one big theory of everything when it comes to AZ, the Draconids, and the life force of Pokemon. So sit back, relax. If you do sit forward, make sure it's to click the link in the description to head on over to my merch store before it closes down get things while you can stock is limited thank you all so much for watching and enjoy this pokemon theory of everything Hello, Pokemon Masters, Berkey Toby here, and I've made it down to a part of Japan that inspired Hoenn. We're somewhere between Rustbro and Fall Harbor, so maybe Meteor Falls. You might recognize these three from Attack on Titan, but the only Titan, the only giant I'm interested in right now is that of AZ, a man from the ancient past who's talked about by the Draconids that live in this very area. Dating back thousands of years, his history is interesting, and he knows all the secrets to infinity energy and a cursed past. There's someone in the Kalos region who has seen the passage of time as he has wandered all across the earth. AZ, a man of 3,000 years. He is giant and immortal when you meet him in Pokemon X and Y, but in his own time, 3,000 years ago, he was normal, a human, but he was a king. Some might say he was the king of multiple Pokemon regions. We'll talk about that shortly. First, what you must know is that he was the king at the time of the ultimate war 3000 years ago. This war was ended by the creation of the ultimate weapon, which used the life force of Xerneas or Evelpal. It used the life energy of Pokemon to not only restore his fallen partner Pokemon Floette, but to end the war with a cataclysmic blast. In a great sadness, his Floette left him for 3000 years, now a mortal like he was, and he began to grow in size, likely as a result of being exposed to that energy. We know throughout Pokemon that changing size and shape as a result of excess energy is a thing. We see this with Gigantamax Pokemon, Totem Pokemon, Noble Pokemon, and Titan Pokemon. And AZ began to travel the world. He took with him a key that would be needed to activate the device should someone find it. And the ultimate weapon was buried by AZ's younger brother. You can learn about this by some files in Lysander's lab, which are only available for a very short window of the game time. Lysander has these files as he is the descendant of AZ's younger brother and ultimately is researching where the ultimate weapon has been hidden underneath Geosenge Town. However, very shortly after your battle with Lysander, the ultimate weapon has a false start and ends up blowing up itself. So who exactly was AZ? Where did he come from? How did he become king? And who was his younger brother? Well, there's evidence that AZ was from the Unova region. If we look to the Parfum Palace, which is inspired by the Palace of Versailles, we see this picture of what looks to be King Louis XIII. However, this is actually supposed to be a picture of AZ. This is one of AZ's palaces across Kalos, and in the garden, Reshiram and Zekrom. Parfum Palace was built 300 years ago, and to be clear, Reshiram and Zekrom have been stuck in the white and black stones for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years before this, which means their statues being here, they can only have been designed by someone who actually saw those Pokemon thousands of years prior. Sure enough, in Unova in the ancient times, there was two kings of Unova, or two heroes, depending on the canon you're looking at. I believe in the time before AZ's giant war and the ultimate weapon firing that AZ and his younger brother were the royalty of Unova. We actually know that one of the kings, at least, is buried in the tomb that is the Abyssal Ruins in the east of the region. In the west, there is the Relic Castle, and sure enough, in the Abyssal Ruins are the Relic items, along with 14 of the Arceus Plates. There are also inscriptions all over the world. And there's a lot of symbolism here, and there's a lot of reasons why and to do with character length, but it is theorized that the name of the person who was buried here, the royalty, was someone called Harmonia, which links them to Getsis. In fact, the crown that Getsis uses to crown N at the beginning of the game is the Relic Crown, and it's the same item that you can find here in the Abyssal Ruins. But there's something super interesting about the Abyssal Ruins. As I've mentioned already, there were 14 of the Arceus plates there as well. So AZ has a connection to Arceus? Why were they buried down there? Well, it could well be the case that the other Arceus plate, the one that's of course missing from those that are found in the Abyssal Ruins, the Fairy Plate, 
is the one that they left behind in the Galar region. That's because, yes, a further connection here, I believe that Aze and his brother before they were kings of Kalos and kings of Unova were the king heroes of the Galar region. Yes, those that we learn about from the darkest day. Not only is the relic crown the same shape as Zacian's crown, and that's about to be super important, but also, Pokemon are yet again in the space of just a couple of generations, referring back to this same mythos of two heroes. And what do you know, the darkest day was 3,000 years ago. I suspect not the same day as the day the ultimate weapon fired. I actually believe that the story that's happening in Galar is when these two are quite young. The story starts that the two heroes on the darkest day wish upon a wishing star. Then the darkest day happens. Eternatus wakes up, but Eternatus has been around for much longer. We know that from Pokedex entries that it actually dates back to 20,000 years ago. Why did it wake up 3,000 years ago? The two heroes awaken Zacian and Zamazenta and fight against this Pokemon. They fight against the Darkest Day and are heralded as heroes. After the battle is done, they bathe in Sir Chester Baths, just north of where the Fairy Plate was buried. I believe that the Darkest Day happened, not as a result of the ultimate weapon firing, but instead as a result of the wish made by these children, a wish to go on a grand adventure, to wake up Eternatus. That might seem ridiculous to you, but actually it's not. I believe that the wishing star that they saw, which they literally describe it as such, is actually not one of the wishing stars that's the part of Eternatus' body, but the other kind of wishing star that we know that travels around the Pokemon world every thousand years. The Millennium Comet, as it's known in the animated series, or just Jirachi, as we know it in the games. Jirachi's signature move, after all, despite being a wish-fulfilling Pokemon, is that of Doom Desire. I suspect that the conflicting wishes of these two heroes resulted in an apocalypse and the saving of that apocalypse, the darkest day, which would only last for a day. And this is where our heroes of the time would learn everything they need to learn about giant felling from the plates of Arceus, which, as written, tell us that the power of fallen giants were infused within the plates. With these sacred tablets in hand and Zashkin and Zamazenta by their side, AZ and his brother were able to defeat the giant Pokemon on the darkest day and ultimately put Eternatus back to sleep. It is interesting to note that in Zashin and Zamazenta's Pokedex entry, they're described as the Fairy King's sword for Zashin and the Fighting Master's shield, suggesting that even though they were both ultimately crowned and both technically kings, one became the Fighting Master while the other ruled as king. Fairy King is also interesting because it's the fairy plate that was left behind south of Surchester. The rest of the plates were taken, of course, to Unova when they ultimately colonized. We also see this, by the way, with one of the chief Pokemon found by the Abyssal Ruins being Frillish, and Frillish being dressed like uh, noble dignitaries from, like, England and France, actually. Yet a further connection. That's besides the point. All of the relics of the Abyssal Ruins are also said to be 3,000 years old, dating them to the time of the Darkest Day and the ultimate weapon firing. And the connection might be drawn because the relic statue also looks a little bit like Deanne. Deancey is a Pokemon that's created from an irradiated carbink as a result of an exposure to a certain kind of energy or beam. It's possible that this beam was the very beam of the ultimate weapon 3,000 years ago. Carbink can commonly be found in the nearby mystical reflection cave, so it seems likely that Deancey is from here, especially as it's the only Kalos Pokemon that can mega evolve and its pink diamond structure matches that of the Anastar City Sundial. I'll digress. There's also a connection here to another mythical Pokemon, a Pokemon I don't think I've ever mentioned in any Pokemon theory ever before. That is the mythical Pokemon Meloetta. Another Pokemon somehow connected to, you know, over, it's possibly connected to this story. It knows a special move called Relic Song, and there are 32 relics in the Relic Castle. Meloetta's Relic Song would be the 33 relic, and 33 has some special symbolism around it. But the interesting part is this might be how Jirachi ties into the overall narrative. I didn't just get it out of nowhere. Yes, it's a wishing star, much like the wishing stars of the Galar region, but it is also said that Jirachi wakes up with a song, and according to an NPC talking about Meloetta, it seems to have lost its song when darkness covered the world, connecting all of these elements together. It is also true that the crown that was forged for AZ is that of his Pokemon, Zacian. Zacian and Zamazenta were hidden away in the rusted sword and the rusted shield and tucked away, uh, hidden out of sight. Ultimately, over time, the history was even changed from being two heroes to one hero, and we see that statue in Motostoke. It was the younger brother who shunned AZ and ultimately hid the ultimate weapon, and it was he who told his sons about it. It's interesting to know that in the Lysander Land, 
Labs. Farnell's AZ was said to be the first king of Kalos, which means he is the one who settled the region and perhaps even established the Kalos region as we know it today. He took the plates to Yanova next, where he and his brother fought over truth and ideals with Reshiram and Zekrom. A palace was created in the Kalos region, where he went to then further expand his rule and ultimately the Great War happened. The ultimate weapon is fired and finally their history is at an end. The little brother helps AZ bury the weapon. AZ goes traveling with the key and is no longer a king. He is an immortal who becomes giant himself with all of this knowledge on how wishing stars works, on how the Arceus plates work, and of course ultimately one day he would bury his brother in the abyssal ruins with those very plates. And in the ruins, an old writing system. Not the oldest, however. Braille exists throughout the Pokemon world created by the Draconids. And also there is another type of writing. The Unknown. Their ruins can be seen all over the Pokemon world, but not dating back that far. The Tenobi ruins are said to be around 1500 years old, which means that they were created during AZ's time. Additionally, with the existence of the Arceus plates, we can finally move on and talk about what all of this has to do with the Draconids. Part 2, The Law Keepers, The Draconids We know of course that the Arceus plates are tied to Arceus, and Arceus is tied to the unknown. It's not just a writing system, but also the fabric that seems to hold together the Pokemon world as seen in the Darkrai movie, and of course in the uh, Sinjo Ruins clip. We see Arceus use these unknown to create Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina in the Sinjo Ruins. We think that Ho-Oh used these Pokemon alongside to create Raikou, Entei, and Suicune, and perhaps even give long life to humans in Ecritique, who seem to remember the falling of the tower 150 years ago, something not too dissimilar to AZ's long life. In the manga, Team Rocket used the Arceus plates here to control Arceus. The mystery stage is described as Cynthia as also being a place that people use to show respect to Arceus, and they celebrate with music and dance. So this knowledge is passed down by people like Cynthia and the Kimono Girls, who seem to know a lot about the lore of the Pokemon world. Between them, they know about Dialga and Palkia and Arceus. They know about Ho-Oh and Lugia. They're not too dissimilar from the Dragon Clan, the Draconid. The Dragon Clan also exists in the north side of the Johto region, and in the manga, we see that their leader has a Rayquaza upon their head. This this isn't an accident. There's also the embedded tower in Johto where Groudon, Kyogre, and Rayquaza can be found. Markings on the floor of the embedded tower match those found in Sky Pillar. Sky Pillar and Cave of Origin sounding very similar to the Hall of Origin and Spear Pillar. Not only that, the Cave of Origin and the Sky Pillar are both guarded by Kimono Girls. As you can tell very quickly, all of these areas across Johto, Hoenn, and Sinnoh seem to be connected, and all of these clans of Kimono Girls and Dragon Tribes, whether that's Cynthia's family from Celestic Town, or perhaps the Draconids from Hoenn, all seem to be related. And this makes sense. We learn about the Draconids from Zinnia, who is herself a descendant of the original tribe that lived in what is now Meteor Falls, their home destroyed 2,000 years ago by that same meteorite shower that brings with it Jirachi. Since then, they've been nomadic, traveling across the Pokemon world and keeping Pokemon lore, so that makes sense for all of the aforementioned groups. We also know they traveled the world by way of sea. Sivalog Town is right next to the Sky Pillar, but it's also next to the Braille Puzzle from which you can access the Regis. The Regis locked away eons ago by an ancient people. I suspect the Draconids. Perhaps a precursor to the unknown writing is the Braille writing, which can be found all across the Pokemon world. This would tie them directly to the people who built the Snowpoint Temple at the north end of Sinnoh, but perhaps again all the way back to Galar, where Regigigas can be found in the Crown Tundra deep underground. And temples to Regidrago and Regileki can be unlocked. Meanwhile, across the world in the Alola region is the Seafolk Village, again another group of nomadic people who seem to have ended up on the island, the one island that is the home to the altar of sun and moon. They have their hands in pretty much every legend that happens across the Pokemon world. And when we think about how they traveled, whether by sea or by land, if they were traveling north from the Johto region through the Dragon's Den where that dragon clan was established, then they would have made their way up to Isui that way. I believe that these are the people from Sinjo that Kogita references in the old verse. At least we assume this is the writing of Kogita. She references the fact that Sinjo is kind of like the Hisui region. If people traveled north to Hisui from the Johto region, they would have passed through Sinjo. And in fact, this is what they describe as the birthplace of the Sinnoh people. Perhaps it was there that they learned about Arceus and decided to continue to pursue the lore and knowledge about it by traveling upwards. 
Kogita, of course, is settled in the Ancient Retreat, and she brings with her legendary Pokemon as well. She has Enamorous with her. One day, though, this will become Celestic Town, where there'll be a shrine not too dissimilar to the shrine that appears in the Unova region that looks just like this. This is connected to Landorus Thunderous Tornadus, but it's also very similar to the shrine that appears in the Ilix Forest that Celebi uses. So there are a lot of connections between all of these different peoples and clans. And of course, her descendant is Cynthia. And while Cynthia herself isn't technically a dragon Pokemon trainer specifically, her Pokemon are very interesting. She uses Lucario, which is a Pokemon of immense aura, Togekiss, which has its own ties to the Kimono Girls, uh, Spiritomb, which has its ties to Infinity and the spirits of Pokemon, and then of course, Garchomp, her lead dragon Pokemon. Furthermore, in the Kalos region, she seems to have a cousin, which is Drasna, who has all dragon Pokemon. Pokemon and says that she comes from a Sinnoh village that respects old traditions. This is clearly, of course, talking about Celestica Town. And Celestica Town is, of course, where the Celestica people got their name. The Celestica people simply used to be Draconids, likely the very ones that built the Snowpoint Temple. Anyway, I digress. From what we know about the Draconids from Zinnia, we know that they have a sacred duty, and that is law keeping. Law keeping in relations to dragons, sure, but about all the legends of the Pokemon world. So the question becomes, when did they get this mission? How did it happen? And this is where I connect the two halves of the video together. Their culture and their entire tradition was given to them back in Meteor Falls by the one and only AZ. Just some points here for context, 2,000 years ago was when Rayquaza first appeared. 1,000 years ago was when the Draconids wished for it to mega evolve, which happened thanks to a meteorite. AZ was there, and he named it the Delta Pokemon. He likely traveled to Meteor Falls as a result of everything that went down with the ultimate weapon and the darkest day, likely to try and find Jirachi, the wishing star Pokemon, from which both so much great had happened, but also so much terrible. He found the Draconid people and taught them about so many of the Pokemon worlds, what we consider legends today, taught them of the Arceus plates and likely warned them of the prophecy of a wishing star that will come by in yet another thousand years. Zinnia also knows of the Kalos War and she has a particular question for the player character about if they follow truth or ideals. A very pointed question from someone who also must know the lore of Unova. So Zinnia knows the lore of the Pokemon world, a responsibility handed down from her ancestors, likely given to them by AZ, the man who discovered all of this lore. But her job is not just to pass it down from herself to her descendants, it's also to safeguard this information from those who wish to use this knowledge for a great evil. Organizations like Aqua, Magma, and Flare to be sure, but also to protect it from the seemingly friendly corporations in the Pokemon world. Tired of running out of potions, TMs, and Pokeballs? This is where Devon is your best friend. Here at the Devon Corporation in Rustboro, we believe that the power of science is amazing. We're working on everything from Pokemon Dream Vision to the restoration of ancient Pokemon fossils. And we're bringing these incredible scientific advancements to you at your local Pokemart. The Pokeball is now just 200 Poke Dollars, and for every 10 you buy, you get yourself a Premier Ball all for free. Nowhere else in the Pokemon world can you get this kind of saving, so get on out there, Pokemon trainers, and catch them all. The Devon Corporation, a Pokemon trainer's best friend. Hey Pokemon Masters, Bunky Patobi here and I've made it to the Hoenn region. This is Fukuoka City in Japan, or as you might know it, Rustbro. You can already hear the brass instruments in the air. I'm here, of course, doing research on one of the big technological companies, Devon, responsible for Pokeballs, medicines, and of course, the Hoenn Pokedex. I've been researching many Pokemon out here, but what's more interesting than the Pokemon is the technology itself. Because this technology, Pokemon Masters, is nothing ordinary. It was made from something very dark and very sinister. I'm talking, of course, about Infinity Energy. Part 3, The Abuse of Infinity Energy, the Life Force of Pokemon. The most powerful force in all of the Hoenn region is by far the Devon Corporation. Their reach can be felt across the region, and they're responsible for Pokemon technologies like Silphco. They create the Pokeballs of that region. They are also involved in Fossil Resurrection, a powerful technology that also Silphco has access to. And one researcher in the facility talks about working on a technology to see into Pokemon's dreams, a technology realized in the Unova region. The company's president, Mr. Stone, tells you about these technologies and how they came about, how his grandfather learned to harness the life energy 
energy of Pokemon itself to fuel these technologies. His grandfather was able to discover the methods that AZ had learned and harness the power of what he trademarked as Infinity Energy. It's not actually called Infinity Energy, it is simply the life essence or life force of Pokemon. You may also know it as Aura, and you may see versions of it in the form of Gigantamaxing, Z Crystals, and of course, being used for Mega Evolution. But this is trademark Infinity Energy, and they use it on their submarines for deep sea exploration and on the rockets that they send up from the Moss Deep Space Center for deep space exploration. They can use this technology to open wormholes, as we see in the Delta episode, between realities. The power of Infinity Energy is truly infinite. And there was a time in Hoenn's history when this energy was being used for an incredibly important project. The Sea Marvel. The Sea Marvel, of course, shares its name with Marvel City, and also the New Marvel, which is nearby. The New Marvel was intended to be a giant underground bunker of many floors. However, the project was cancelled. While the player can access the top floor, in theory, there are 69 floors underground, but the project died in development. We can learn more about this at the Sea Marvel, which today is a nature preserve for Pokemon, but it's littered with letters and notes from the time that it was used to harness the energy of Pokemon. For example, the Sea the innocent 10 slogans for a cheerful and fun workplace. Say good morning very loudly. Don't bring your Pokemon to the workplace. A strange thing for a world that's focused on people and Pokemon walking together. Always arrive on time and always stay late. Lay your life on the line in safety checks. So you have to be safe and you have to dedicate yourself to the job. Take joint responsibility for teamwork and obey your superior's orders absolutely. So now there's a clear hierarchy. Maintain top quality. Give up your sanity. Worship and praise the founder. Beginning to sound like a cult. Don't expect time off before you retire. And finally, no need to think. Just work unceasingly. These are the slogans for a cheerful and fun workplace? This is not the kind of place that you would want to work if you had any other option. It seems that the goings on here were pretty shady. The need to not bring your Pokemon work and to lay your life on the line for safety checks implies that something dangerous is happening here as well. This is indicated by the presence of Spiritomb and an odd keystone. There's an apology note in the same room where Spiritomb can be captured from Professor Cosmo's dad. I am responsible for the loss of the odd keystone donation by the Orberg mine. Why did the people working here need an odd keystone? And what's this got to do with Devon? Well, you can find a special confidential Devon secret investigation report, which says that the development of the new energy turned out to be true. The energy uses Pokemon's bioenergy. It's called Infinity Energy. This seems to suggest that the Devon Corporation were committing corporate espionage. Assuming that CEOs of companies live a really long time, as Mr. Stone himself is already very old, we can assume that perhaps it was even even the case, but his grandfather was alive and CEO for a long time, possibly even just skipping over his father. If so, this may be how his grandfather learned about Infinity Energy. It also mentions a report on Watson, who's deemed to be a traitor to the cause. Watson is a gym leader who is alive and well today, so this is recent history. In the manga, there was also a lore keeper before Zinnia, Aster, who died in a fire in the Embedded Tower protecting Rayquaza, and it was the Devon Corporation who were trying to capture this Pokemon for the Pokemon Association the main government in the Pokemon manga. Zinnia rescued her burnt cape from the fire and of course named her Wisma after her. And the odd keystone? Well, it's not just a nod to the fact that the Sea Marvel is on Route 108 and Spiritomb is the combination of 108 angry spirits, but it is in fact just that. But it's the combination of spirits, lost spirits, perhaps angry because their life energy was used in the pursuit of technological discovery. This is why you don't bring your Pokemon to work at the Sea Marvel. As well as Cosmo's dad and Watson the traitor, there was also the man with no power. His notebook can be found in the Sea Marvel. It's an old hidebound notebook. And it says, The damage caused by the cancellation of the new Marvel project has been catastrophic. As a member of the management, much of the blame and the debts will fall upon me. But that will be little consolation to my employees working under me who will lose their livelihoods. Which does make sense. To work in this job, you'd have to be desperate. And so these people needed this job. He laments that he is a man with no power, protecting nature, Pokemon, and the environment. It's a great idea, a fine ideal to aspire to, and Watson is a great man for dreaming of it all. But cruel reality and the organization that I must try to preserve have dashed those dream. So this is to suggest that the Sea Marvel was originally designed to preserve and protect nature and Pokemon and the environment. 
That's what the Sea Marvel was trying to do for the new Marvel project. So in what way was it trying to protect the world? And Watson was the man that dreamt of it all? It seems that perhaps he had a great ideal, but as the man with no power says, cruel reality has set in. Perhaps Watson wanted to protect nature and Pokemon and the environment, but couldn't do so without going by unethical means, and so pulled the plug on the project. So. What use would the Hoenn region have for a 69 floor underground bunker? And the answer of course is to save people and Pokemon in the case of a, an apocalyptic event. Hoenn is no stranger to apocalypses. Meteorites fell down 2,000 years ago, destroying the home of the Draconid people. A thousand years ago, a meteorite came down and actually created the crater from which Sutopolis City was built out. And that's fine now, but meteorites hit the Hoenn region every thousand years. Another well-placed one could take out Sutopolis City, or perhaps any of the other central hubs in Hoenn. While the Moss Deep Space Center does act as a sort of orbital defense for the Hoenn region, protecting against meteorite showers with their various technologies. Technologies described as Zinnia as being abominable. It doesn't hurt to have a failsafe, a place for the people of Hoenn to go. And it's not just the threats above the sky that fall down, but no, the Hoenn region has Groudon and Kyogre that can warp and tear apart the land and sea. Too much water or too much land? An underground bunker could survive them all. And actually this ties into Team Aqua and Magma's plan. See, both Shelly and Tabitha, high-ranking members of the organization, used to work for the Devon Corporation. And there are files in the basis for Team Aqua and Magma talking about primal energy, the same energy that Devon has turned into infinity energy, the trademark version. This primal energy used to flow regularly through Groudon and Kyogre and all Pokemon of old. The Azoth project was to have Archie or Maxi awaken Kyogre or Groudon and revert to the world to its primal state by using this energy. Possibly they learned about this energy from Shelby and Tabitha. But of course, not only standing in their way as you the hero of Hoenn, but also the Draconid people who are also familiar with this energy. They learnt about this energy from AZ, the name of which likely inspired the Azoth project. But none of this changes the fact that Pokeballs are still being produced today. And in the olden day, it seems that Pokeballs were produced by an Apricorn and special ore jetting up from the ground, also likely filled with the life energy of Pokemon in a more natural state. Meteorites and rocks are a big part of Pokemon and they can contain energies. Uh, that's also seen in like the red and blue orb, for example. But that's besides the point. To produce Pokeballs on a mass scale in the same way Devon does, in the way that Selfco does, or using this technology to see inside a Pokemon's dreams, the dream world being a literal other realm in the world of Pokemon, like ripping open a wormhole into a Pokemon's mind, much like how the wormhole technology uses infinity energy, we have to assume that infinity energy is still being used today. And just because the new and sea marvel projects have been shut down, we are much like the man with no power. We have to face the cruel reality of it all. The Pokeballs are fueled by infinity energy. The question is just how much of the Pokemon's life force do they take? I mentioned earlier and in plenty of other videos how this energy displays itself in all sorts of different ways. There's aura and gigantamaxing, there's uh, Z crystals, and there's even noble Pokemon that seem to get the energy direct from Arceus itself. The more energy you add, the more the Pokemon can grow and transform. They become more powerful. It's thought that this energy is in fact the energy of evolution. It was irradiated at evolution stone that created the Mega Stones. The more energy you have, the more powerful the Pokemon can become. And this is confirmed pretty much with the Pokeball and the power that's inside, with the red light beam being pretty reminiscent of the red light beam that comes out from the Max Raid Dens. It's an outpouring of energy that literally changes the Pokemon size, much like the Pokeballs. So it's possible that the technology harnesses this energy in a way that doesn't outright kill the Pokemon or hurt it too much but it does take some level of energy and agency away from the Pokemon. And in fact, it could well be the case why these evil team leaders, despite the fact that they have Master Balls in the offices of Team Aqua and Magma and Team Galactic, don't use those Master Balls to catch the legendary Pokemon because it would take away some of their life essence and weaken them. In fact, Cyrus says exactly this. This is why he seeks out the Red Chain instead of using the Master Ball to catch Dialga or Palkia. So let's hope, at the very least, that these Pokeballs are being made, at least somewhat ethically. So Pokemon Masters, you still sitting back and relaxing? Good. 
Here, let's draw these threads together. It's my belief that 3,000 years ago, two young hero children wished upon a wishing star that brought about the darkest day. A darkest day they were able to defeat with the help of Zashkin, Zamazenta, and lore about legendary Pokemon, including the Arceus Plates. Using their status and their new kingdom of the Galar region, they traveled over to the Unova region, where they became the hero kings of Unova, the youngest of which would eventually be buried in the Abyssal Ruins with the other Arceus Plates. The elder of the brothers, of course, AZ, also becoming the king of the Kalos region, basically king of the Pokemon world. However, he used everything he learned about legendary Pokemon and the life force of Pokemon, abused this technology, creating the ultimate weapon to help revive his flow at AZ. He knew about the lore of legends of the Pokemon world and traveled across the earth, ultimately passing this knowledge on to lore keepers called the Draconids. It was their role to be guardians of this knowledge, knowing that such abuse could result in the wiping out of possibly an entire Pokemon nation and killing many, many Pokemon. However, in the modern day, there are technological companies, Devon, and I suspect, as you've probably seen in other Pokemon theories of mine, the Self Corporation, that have tapped into this very energy for technological means. And so once again, we have to be careful how we use this technology. We must learn from AZ's mistake 3,000 years ago. And this is really only the tip of the Pokemon theory iceberg. Over the last couple of months and years, I've done so many Pokemon theories that tie into this. The ethics of his catching Pokemon wrong. Uh, the dream world, how does it work? Uh, why Togepi is extraordinary. The combination of the four legendary big boss Pokemon ultimately being parts of the Arceus. Silphco and how they use teleportation. How Giovanni probably used teleportation and infinity energy slash the life force of Pokemon to open up wormholes into other realities for Team Rainbow Rocket. How this energy created the Blood Moon Ursa Luna in, in Kitakami. There, there is so many of my videos tying into this. This literally is the tip of the iceberg. So if you want to go anywhere deeper, uh, make sure to check out my whole Pokemon Pokemon epics or Pokemon theories playlist. The epics are the ones where there's usually like me doing cool live action stuff like in this video. The theories are the ones that are exactly the same just without that. Loads linked in the description. Enjoy the world of Pokemon theories and while you're down there in the description don't forget of course to click the link at the top of the description to head on over to my merch store and pick up some of my incredible merch. Tropical festivities is going to be gone forever soon so thank you all so much for watching and of course so hi Pokemon Masters. Hello there it's me Professor Oak. This video is over, so please choose another one wisely and quickly. Bye-bye. Thank you anyone who has ever contributed through Patreon, and especially the big patrons of this month, Lucas Gates, Anthony Lee, Charmander Anzibal, White Seed Deke, Pancake, Immortal Absol, and Jed Rubin. Thank you for your incredible support.